maybe pressed the wrong button, or I pressed the wrong button twice. Um, also, it looks like most of you guys have decided that you would prefer not to get solutions, but submit until later. That was like 63% of the class. If you're still interested in seeing solutions, what mine are, uh, stop by office hours, and I will give you a copy. You promise not to share them with anybody else outside your group, right? Because if you do, that's considered cheating. You get sent to SGA, and you'll probably end up with a zero in the class. Uh, for the other assignments that have already like passed the due dates, I'll open them back up again uh, so that you can submit them until the end of the quarter. Again, though, this gives you like enough, enough like rope to commit academic suicide in this class. So uh, make sure you're still trying to hit the deadlines as they're posted, because if you don't, you're probably going to end up too far behind on the material to actually reasonably finish it. If you're running like a day or two behind, that's probably fine. But any more than that, things aren't going well, and you need to stop by office hours to get help. So the first thing I want to talk about is a nuance that kind of comes with C++ and how things are compiled. It's called circular dependencies. We're going to talk about what they are and how to avoid them. So circular dependencies kind of show up when two or more classes depend on each other. For example, you might have like a brother and a sister class. A brother might have a sister, and a sister might have a brother, right? These two classes now require each other. Or a player might have a move, right, be able to make a move, but the move might also need to know which player made it. Or if you're playing a game of Monopoly and you wanted to implement that via programming, Right, you might have that players own some set of properties, but you might need it so the properties know who their owner is, so that when somebody lands on them, you know who to charge or who to pay the money to. These situations are really common. They are completely legitimate and they can exist. Um, it's just that the compiler sometimes has trouble compiling this code correctly. So we need to give it a little bit of help in order to, for it to be able to do this kind of thing. So a circular dependency looks like something like this. A.h includes B.h, and B.h also includes A.h, right? You can see there's a circle, right? You can go from A to B and from B back to A. This circle could be a little bit longer, though. You might have A includes B, B includes C, C includes D, D includes A, right? And so you're able to get back to A again. Uh, one way that you can kind of figure out if you have a circular dependency in your code is by doing the following. You write out each of your header files, because, again, your header files are the only ones that should be including each other. And then for each header file, what you would do is you would draw a line or an arrow from it to the header files that it includes. If you're able to get back from starting it from one header file, get back to itself again, that's how you know you have a circular dependency in your code. Does that make sense? So the way that you're able to eliminate circular dependencies um, is by using forward declarations. And a forward declaration just looks like class class name semicolon. What you're telling the compiler is that this class exists. And so the compiler will thank you for that. And when it sees that symbol <clears> later on, uh, it will be able to say, oh, that symbol does exist, and it will be able to compile. Um, if you do have a templated class, uh, you would just say template, whatever your template type parameters are for that class, then class name. And then in your CPP files, you're going to include any of the necessary .h files that you need. Um, it's safe to include any .h file in a .cpp file because you don't include .cpps, right? So there's no way to create that circle if the cpps are including things because you'll never be able to get back to that cpp again because no one will include it. Um, sometimes, though, you might need to declare a, a forward declare a class in another namespace. You can't do namespace colon colon class name for that forward declaration, right? Class namespace colon colon class name. That's what I thought you would do. Um, instead, you kind of have to redeclare the namespaces again and do the definitions inside of them. So if we had a class inside of space one called some class, um, you would forward declare it this way. You would just say namespace space one, right? You redeclare the class again, class some class. Or again, if it, that, that, that namespace is nested a little bit farther in, right? You have outer space, inner space, some class, namespace, outer space, namespace, inner space, class, some class, and then you have the curly brackets to wrap them up. Um, if you have multiple classes inside that same namespace you need to forward declare, you can do them all here at once. So if you had like class 2, class 3, class 4 that all needed to be in outer space, inner space, you can just do those lines underneath like class, class 1, class, class 2, class, class 3, class, class 4, instead of having to rewrite out this entire portion every single time. 
Does that make sense? So let's pop over to an example of like why this kind of happens. So again, I have some piece of code over here where we have main. Go back to those files in a second. Um, so over here, right, I have a brother and a sister class, which we can see here. So here's brother.h. We have class brother. We have a constructor where you can give it either the name of the, the person as well as who their sister is supposed to be. And then, or you can just say that they have um, a name and no sister right now. And then we have like get name and get sister. Also, one thing to point out here is that sister is a sister pointer. Um, it's not an instance of a sister class. A pointer is like a reference, except it doesn't have to refer to anything. And the syntax for utilizing it is a little bit different. Um, the reason why you couldn't have like a brother has a sister as a member, um, there's two reasons. The first is not all brothers may have sisters, right? They might be have like other brothers. They might be only children. Um, but the other thing is, is if a brother had a sister class inside of it, and a sister class had a brother class inside of it, you kind of end up with like an infinite structure, right? Like a brother has a sister, but that sister has to now have a brother. Well, that brother now has to have a sister inside of it. And that sister now has to have a brother in it. And that brother has to have a sister inside of it. So you end up with a class that's like an infinite like series of Russian dolls, right? Where every brother, you open it up, has a sister inside. You open up the sister, it has to have a brother inside. You open up the sister, it has to have another brother inside. And so that class would now be infinitely big and the compiler could never create it. So that's why we can't have like a sister has a brother class directly inside of it and a brother has a sister class directly inside of it. Um, but the pointers are fine because they don't actually create an instance of that class. They create something like a reference. And we'll be talking about pointers next week. Um, but we can then uh, later direct it uh, later on point to who are actually our brother or our sister is. Do you guys have any questions over here right now? Yeah. So like a pointer is kind of, well, we'll get into the details of this like next week because it's like a whole week topic for talking about pointers. Um, but you know how like a reference is another name for uh, a variable? A pointer is essentially like a reference that doesn't always have to refer to another variable. So it can be a reference to another variable or it can refer to nobody at all. Any other questions? <coughs> So does anything like inside these classes look crazy? Right, so he can hear sister, his brother, and they both include each other, right? If we look at their, you know, like their class files, there's nothing really crazy going on here. We just initialize the members if they're passed in. Um, the sister, if not specified, is set to null pointer. That means I'm not actually pointing to anybody. That means I don't have a sister right now. You're able to get your name. You're able to get whoever your sister is. Uh, you're also able to set whoever your sister is. And you are also able to uh, get there, uh, also able to print them out. So if you have a sister, you'll print out you know, your name, has a sister name, whatever, or they don't have a sister. And then the sisters are more or less the exact same thing, except they have brothers instead of sisters. So everything here kind of looks like it should be legal. It should be cool, right? But if I try to go build this, and we look over here, we have this complaint. Brother has not been declared on line 14 of sister.h. If I look over here, I gonna see like brother, and I might be a bit confused, because I'm like, hey, I included brother. Why does that symbol not exist? So the reason, the way to figure this out is to look at it, how the compiler actually views the code. So what does pound include mean? means copy paste, right? Copy and paste the contents of that file in here. So if we look at this and we look at the uh, sister includes the brother, what I've kind of done is I've rewritten the class, but I've expanded the pound include to actually just copy and paste the code in there like the compiler would. Right? So here's what the sister class looks like. So here's the pound include of string and O stream. And then this is the inclusion of brother, right? So we copy and paste. We would go to include sister.h again, 
But when we come back around, we would find that, oh, this symbol has already been defined. So we would just skip line 16. It does nothing. Does that make sense? All right, we go to include sister.h again, but this symbol already exists. Right, it's already been defined. So we actually skip this line of code, nothing happens. And then over here, here's my class brother, so class brother. And I look down here and I see sister. Well, have you seen sister at all yet? Have you seen a, a type called sister at all? No, and so the compiler's like, I haven't either, and I give up. The symbol doesn't exist. Right, and so we end up with this error about the compiler not being able to figure out what a sister object is. But maybe we might want to look at it the other way around, with the brother including the sister. So again, we have the expansion of the uh, pound include of sister. Again, this line's going to be skipped because when we include brother uh, dot h again, the symbol's already been defined, so we'd skip over the re-inclusion. And then we define our class sister, and then we find, oh, here's a brother symbol. But have you seen a, a symbol named brother in this file? No, compiler hasn't either, so it gives up and fails. It's like, I have not seen this symbol before. I don't know what to do about it, and it stops compiling. And this is because C is that top-down, one-pass compiler. It only goes through each file once, right? If it was able to keep reading, right, it would be fine, but because it stops reading and it needs that symbol to be predefined, it dies. Does this make sense? Do you guys have questions here why this is failing at all? So if you start getting errors about symbols not existing or not being declared or defined, right, this is going to mean you have some circular inclusion going on in your code. So we'll show you in a minute how to fix that. So again, the forward declarations are the fix. Um, but there are some limits on what you can have with a forward declaration. If you have a forward declaration of a class, right, and that's all you have, you don't actually have the class's uh, definition, you can create a reference to that class, a pointer to that class. You can also have functions that accept references or pointers or instances of that class. You can also have functions that return references, pointers, or instances of that class. Those are all fine. But if all you have is that forward declaration, there are a couple of things you can't do. You can't have an instance of that class. So if I only have a forward declaration of some class, I cannot create it. I also cannot access any members or methods of that class as well. Right? This is going to be why in the .cpp files where you actually need to do your function definitions and you need to be able to access those members, this is why you're going to have to include them in the .cpp files so that you're able to have those full-on function or full-on class definitions so you know what members and methods you can use. Does this make sense? Right? This limitation up here is fine in the .h files. Why? Because you don't need to access the members or methods in the .h files, right? Because you're not actually writing any code. You're just declaring that things exist. Because again, with the forward declarations, all you're telling the compiler is this thing exists, and you gave it no more other information about it. So it doesn't know how big it is. It doesn't know what's inside of it. That's why we can't create instances of it, because I don't know how much space to allocate for it. And I also don't know what I should put inside of it, or how to access what's inside of it, because all you told me is that it's there. There will be those sometimes where you have to include one header file in another. And the only time that you have to do this, which apparently I had a brain fart and I forgot to finish writing the slide, is when you need an instance of that class. Which I guess I did finish it, and I don't remember what I was planning on writing. So if in the header file you need an instance of that class, right, that's when you'd have to include a header file. Or if you have your class has a member of that class inside of it, again, not a reference to that class or, or a pointer to that class, but an actual full-on instance of it, that's where you would need to include the header file in that corresponding header file. So for example, this class over here, my class, right, we can get away with just straight function declara or forward declarations inside the header file. Because notice, this function returns an A, but that's fine with a forward declaration. This function returns a B, but that's fine with only a forward declaration. It also accepts references to A's and C's. That's also fine to have references to them. 
a D, I have a pointer to it. Again, that's fine with only a forward declaration. Again, I have a reference to some A inside my class, but again, that's fine with only a forward declaration. Here's where I would need some includes instead. If I actually had instances of A or D inside the class as members, that's when I would need to include A.H and D.H. Because in order to build my class, it needs to know how big those members are um, to be able to allocate the correct amount of space for them inside of myself. So because I have a D and I have an A here, I'm going to have to include A and include D here. But because B and C's, again, I'm only like returning a reference, a returning instance of a B or accepting a reference to a C, I don't need it here. I wouldn't need to include them. Yeah. No, they, they're in, probably in separate files. There's probably like an A.8 or a B.H and a C.H. But again, since I don't actually need their full on function def, uh, their class definitions, I've only forward declared them right here. Any other questions? What? Oh, I, I did indeed miss a semicolon. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is the previous slide. So it wasn't it's in bold. So I know I know it was pretty like similar, and that's kind of the reason that I did it. But they're highlighted in bold the lines that are different. Yeah. yeah it's an instance of that class, correct? Yeah. So, so we're assuming that D is a type, right? And so I want an instance of a D, like an actual um, instance of that variable inside the class. Um, like an instance means like, it's hard for me to come up with like synonyms for it. It's a creation of that class. So when you're doing something like this, um, back here in our example, this right here is a class declaration, right? It tells you how to build one of those classes. If we pop over here to main, Matthew, or like Matt, is an instance of brother. John is an instance of brother. Lily is an instance of sister. Or if we look back here again at like brother.h, um, a brother contains an instance of a string inside of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, I don't have like a good technical definition to give it, but that's a good idea of like what the differences are. Any other questions? Yeah. So we're going to go back to tic-tac-toe in a minute, and we're going to figure out, well, what do we actually need to forward? To, can we get away with only forward declarations? And what do we actually need includes to work with? Um, but before we do that, I would like us to fix this piece of code over here with the brother and sister. So how might I fix it? So we look over here in brother. Do I have an instance of sister inside of me? No. Right? Subtle, but... I have a pointer to a sister, right? I don't have an instance of a sister inside me. I have a like a reference to some other sister, some other girl, right? Who's going to be my sister? So do I need to include sister.h here? No, right? Because I have no instances of sister inside my class. I look over here in uh, brother.h, wherever he is. Oh, sister.h. Do I need to include brother.h in this file? No, I don't, right? Because I don't have any instances of a brother in it. So the way that we can fix this is, here's the correct version. I'll check that out now. So here's the correct version. We now have a forward declaration in the sister class of brother, right? We just say brother exists. And <clears throat> over here in brother.h, we say sisters exist. Then in their corresponding .cpp files, because inside this file, I'm going to need to be able to get access to some of the sister's methods. Right, I need to access the sister's git name. Right, so because I need to be able to access the sister's git name, 
right? I need to include sister.h. If I don't include sister.h, I can't, again, I can't call any methods defined on it. And then over here in sister.cpp, I had to include brother.h because I need to use the brother's git name function. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I could see what like the, the niceness of having that forward declaration is. Wouldn't probably hurt to do it that way, I don't think. But I personally haven't seen that done. But you could do it. I don't think it would cause any problems or any issues just for declaring these classes. Um, but generally, though, you try to limit like what information that you would need inside your header file to only be the stuff that you actually need to talk about. But yeah, you could do that if you um, didn't feel like doing anything. And now when we run our code and build it, right, we can see that it just prints stuff out. And it does build and it does run. Um, some things to point out, like when you're writing your classes, prefer to use the um, forward declarations wherever possible. Right? If you use forward declarations in your header files wherever possible, you will pretty much eliminate the possibility of having any of these circular dependencies, and you will save a lot of headaches when you're trying to compile your code and like shaking up your computer as to why won't you compile? Like the class include is right there. Does this make sense? This is just like a weird technicality of C++, but it can cause quite a bit of problems. So we're gonna go over to tic-tac-toe and we're gonna figure out what we can change and what can't change. So we're gonna look over here at tic-tac-toe.h. So here right now we have include player, include board, and include move.h. I will slowly slide down the screen and you let me know after we get down to the bottom if these things are necessary. Okay. So again, we included player, board, and move. Are all of these forward declares, are all these includes needed? So board, player, and move. So is board needed? Yes. How do you know? What line tells you that? Line 40 tells you that, right? I have an instance of a board inside me. Are players needed? Yes. Because again, we have like a vector of players, right? This one's a little bit subtle, but we do need to know about what the actual object is to be able to declare the vector here. Do we need move? Do I have any instances of move inside my class? Where? But is that an instance of a move inside my class? No, right? I'm able to return an instance of that move, right? Using only a forward declaration. So again, a function can say that it returns an instance of that class. That's fine, right? It's just that you cannot have any instances of that class. Are you guys able to tell the differences between those two statements? It's okay for a function to return an instance of that class with only a forward declaration? That's different than having an instance of that class. There's two different things. One is you say I can declare, I can return something of that type, right? One is I actually have an instance of that type. So move is not needed as a pound include, and we can replace it with a forward declaration. Given that I already have the namespace tic-tac-toe over here, I would need to do the forward declaration of the um, class move inside my namespace. So class move, that's my forward declaration. And then I would take this pound include out of tic-tac-toe.h and I would move it into, you know, line six. Again, the order of the includes don't matter. Any questions on what we did with that file? Yeah. So if I had to include move.h, I would need like a move m 
inside here. That's illegal now. Because all, I, I'm trying to create an instance of that class, but all I have is a forward declaration here now. So that would be not allowed. But again, returning instances of that class, right, that's allowed. Or accepting instances of that class inside of a function, that's also allowed. So if so right now, if I did something like this and I attempt to compile, it's going to give me an error. Right? So you can see right here, field M has incomplete type. Tic-tac-toe game, colon, colon, move, right? All the compiler knows is that it exists. Again, even if I just had a reference to this class, right? Like this is now legal. Or like this is now legal. It'll compile, right? But if inside this header file, I wanted to do like, you know, m arrow, you know, parse input, that would be illegal because the compiler does not know what a move can do. It just knows a move exists. So that was back here. So this one about M has an incomplete type. An incomplete type means it's only forward declared. I know it says it in different words. I did. Forward declared it right here. This is illegal. This, this is fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. The move function in the .cpp file, like the git move? OK. What are you looking for over here? I have an instance of the move right here on line 42, right? And I also do is valid here. Again, you want to put the forward declarations in the header files to remove the possibilities of those circular dependencies, right? Because the circular dependencies are like, you know, some inclusion of some files where you're able to get back to yourself. But do you ever include CPP files? No, so it's fine to put as many includes in the CPP as you want. You'll never have any issues as long as you never made the mistake of accidentally including the CPP somewhere else. That'll probably lead you to have other problems as well. OK, so let's say we go over here to player.h. Well, do I need to include string? It's the only inclusion I have. Yeah, because I have an instance of a string. Right, that one's pretty easy. Um, we also have move.h. So over here, I've included both player and board. So we can see the, fortunately, we can see the entire thing on the screen. Is player required as a pound include? No, why not? Because we only have references to it, right? Is um, the board necessary? No, because we only have references to it, right? We don't have any instances of that class. So how can we change these includes to be forward declares or forward declarations? Yeah, class player, class board. And then we're going to take these pound includes and move them where? Into the CPP. Right? And let me just double check back here that I got rid of the move. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. The question is, when would you prefer a reference over an instance? A reference is like I actually have that thing inside of me. I am made up of that, right? A reference is I want to be able to refer to something else that already exists, right? So if we go back over here, for example, the player, not player, move. Every time I make a new move, do I need to make a new player? No, but I need to know who made me, right? 
So I want a reference to whoever made me, right? I want that link to whoever made me. So I don't want an instance of a player inside here. It's, it's not static, right? Every player, every move has a player, right? But this reference is going to be a reference to who made me. That person already exists. I do not want a new player. Right? Because a player has to exist to make a move. Right? And I want to reference back to who made me. I don't want a brand new spanking new player, right? Somebody different than who made me. Because even if I made a copy of that player, right, it's a completely separate entity. It's a clone of the original, not the original person that made me. Does that make sense? Yeah. But like back over here, say for example, in the tic-tac-toe game, right? The tic-tac-toe game has a board. There is a board inside of this game, right? It's not a reference to some other board that already exists. When you create a game of tic-tac-toe, you also have to create a board inside of it. Um, so let's move player. We already talked about. Let's move. And I think that's all of them, right? And then we can build, and ta-da, it still builds. Any questions here? Yes. So the question is, why did I move the pound include into the .cpp file? It's because in the .cpp file, I'm going to need to make reference to some of the methods that are defined inside that class. If all I have is a forward declaration, I cannot call any of those methods. Um, for example, if we go back over here to uh, move.cpp. Let's see. So over here in is valid move, right? I need to access some methods of the board, right? And because I need to use those methods, I have to have the pound include of board.h, otherwise I can't say anything about them. I could probably get away with only having a forward declaration of the board, and I would be fine. Not the board, a forward declaration of the player. So I'm fairly sure if I got rid of this line, I would still build. I was wrong. Because this is saying uh, invalid use of incomplete type class to const tic tac toe player maker dot get piece, which happened over here. Oh, yes. So again, I need to access a method of the player. And because I needed to do that, I have to have the pound include of the class or the .h file. Any other questions? Um, also, so like when you're writing your uh, connect end game, try to follow along with using the forward declarations. It will save you a lot of heartache later on uh, when you're trying to make your code work. Um, some other things, as I added a couple of test cases, I think yesterday. So double check those. Um, some of them were about making sure that you got it so that the players don't have duplicate names. So you can't have two players both named Bob. That's really confusing. And the players can't use the same piece regardless of case. So you couldn't have somebody that has like a capital X and a lowercase x, right? Those specifications were there. I added test cases for that as well. Double check, because a lot of you weren't passing those that I think were passing things beforehand. Again, those things were in the specifications. Um, OK, so back to where we left off yesterday with the range class. So again, we are trying to implement a range. So we have range start, range stop, range step. And then the other thing that we probably want to do is, I think we we're talking about a range iterator. And so now we need to implement operator star. So what operator star should do is operator star should, when we dereference it, it should give us the value that we're currently at in the range. Right? So if I was currently at like index 5 of the range between 0 and 10, it should give back 5. So what should I return here? Again, a uh, range iterator has its members, it has a range, and it has a position. So what should I return here? 
Just pause, right? And we're good. So here we have uh, operator plus plus, and this should move us to the next element in the range. How should I get there? Uh, again, so a range iterator had a position and a reference to a range. A range object that we're able to access, it has get range start, get range stop, get range step. So how do I get to the next element in my range? Yeah, you just add that to your position, right? This should be something like position plus equals uh, range dot get range step, right? This will move you to the next element. And then we can return ourselves. Does this make sense? Let's say we wanted to do operator plus plus, but we want to do it post. So here's the easy way of doing this one. What you do is you create a copy. So I make a range iterator called maybe next or something, whatever you want to call it. And it's going to be a copy of myself, right? So it's currently at the spot that it was at, right? Then I add one to myself, right? So I can do plus plus star this, right? I go to the next element, and then I return. And this is probably not next, so I just want to get copy. Right, so I make a copy of myself where I'm at, right? I might be at, you know, position six, right? So this guy stays at six, then we plus plus ourselves, go to seven, but then we return a copy, which was still at the six. So it's a really clever and easy way to get the post increment for free, more or less. Any questions here? Okay. What do you think we should do for operator minus? Or operator minus minus. Again, this is the or minus minus iterator. So pause. Minus equals range dot get range step, right? Return star this. And then we have operator minus minus post which again, we could more or less steal this piece of code up here, but instead do plus plus, we can do minus minus. Do you guys have any questions? You're being very quiet. Yeah. Oh, so we'll get his, then you get yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is possible for us to get past the stop. Um, but we should probably have when we use our um, iterators, right? We have like, you know, iterator equals, you know, begin. Iterator not equal to range.end. So we're still going to have to implement begin and end for that to make sense. And then we're going to have to implement some equals equals and not equals operators to compare the iterators to. Yeah. So remember, this is a pointer to yourself, right? So its type is. Uh, range iterator star, which again, we'll talk about pointers next week. Uh, star this is the, my actual instance. It is, an, a range, uh, it is a range iterator, and so then we're able to return a reference to this range iterator. Um, so we will also do plus equals Well, we'll actually leave out plus equals for right now and plus plus um, because they're not going to be like anything interesting. Or do you want? Do you guys want to see what you think you would do for plus equals? So sure. So like here's the generic plus equals that would work for anything. Um, so you'd say something like you know for int i equals zero i less than right hand side plus plus i plus plus star this that should be inside the for loop
right? That would work. That would move you forward right hand side him out. Not a very elegant way of doing this, but this would work for like any generic iterator. Because some iterators you're going to see like later on, it can't like immediately just advance that much without going between the elements in between. So for us, this could be one way of doing it for like the generic version. So bubble comment it out. This would be like the generic version. Yeah. Oh, why this one doesn't? So why doesn't the plus plus? So like notice that the the, the pre versions they're both range iterators, and then the um, minus minus ones and like the post versions are both const range iterators. Um, the reason why we return a reference to ourselves with these ones is because we modify ourselves first, and then we use the new value when we give it back. The other ones, we kind of have to make a copy to make things work correctly. Right? We're going to have to um, first, um, like, increment or, like, make a copy of ourselves, increment ourselves, and then return the old version. And so when I got rid of, like, the const tiers, the compiler was like, hey, you know, these guys should probably be something different. Well, it said it last time, which is, I think, why I changed it. But it might allow it to be used in a slightly more context. So either doing, like, const range iterator or range iterator, either one I think should work. I guess slightly more expensive here. So I guess prefer pre-increment unless you really need post-increment and you're doing it in like the result of some more complex statement. But like on a single line, pre-increment's probably a little bit better. So now we have a couple of things over here. So I made an operator bool for us. Uh, so operator bool, what it should do is it should return true if we're still inside the range, right? Like if where our position at is still inside the range. So how can I do this? It's not a trick question. <laughs> so we'd have to see like if pause is between star and stop, start and stop, right? Pause has to be greater than or equal to start but strictly less than stop because you don't include stop. Um, that's totally what I went with the first time, but apparently it doesn't work actually in all the cases. You have to have cases based on the, um, the step, right? Because if your step is positive, that makes sense. But if your step is negative, it won't work, right? So if I had a range from something like 10 to 2 by negative 1, right? And if I was currently at position, say, 5, is 5 inside that range? It is, right? But is 5 greater than or equal to my start? No, right? And so we'd say, oh, no, 5 really isn't valid. So we'd have to actually do some small adjustments based on the sign of the step. So we could say if... Right, the um, range dot get step get range step. If that's greater than zero, right? We can probably even do greater than or equal to zero, right? Then our position has to be greater than or equal to range dot get range start, and pause has to be less than uh, range dot get range uh, end, get range stop. Does that make sense? Otherwise, right, it means our sign has to be negative, right? So we need to return, well, the pause has to be what? Not necessarily less than zero, right? We know the step is less than zero at this point, but our pause 
right? If our range was between 10 and 2, right, our position has to be less than or equal to the start, and it has to be strictly greater than the end. So pause has to be, we can just copy this down and then just change some signs. Pause has to be less than or equal to, and it has to be greater than. Right? Just flip the signs around because it's negative. Yes? Is it allowed to? I, like, you can see with the, with the plus plus, it would allow us to go beyond the end. But you're going to see that when we define the not equals in a second, you'd have some iteration that, you know, so, you know, for range equals, like range iterator equals range start, right? Range iterator doesn't equal to the range's end, right? So we need it when we're doing that type of iteration for us to actually stop there. But technically, no, there isn't anything uh, here that would prevent us from going beyond the end, right? Like if someone just had this iterator and they kept just calling plus plus, on it over and over and over and over and over again, it would super duper, yeah, go out of bounds. Uh, do you want to make it so that it doesn't do that? Um, so like what you could, because again, it's going to like depend on um, sign, whether you're going forwards or backwards. But like what we could have over here in operator plus equals is after we incremented it, like if the step is positive, if the position is greater than the range end, make it equal to uh, the range end, right? Otherwise, if the, if the step is less than zero, or is uh, so it's negative, and it's going, um, it's before the end, make it equal to the end. And so you can totally add code in there. We will also hopefully talk about very soon how to do um, exceptions so that if thing, bad things do happen, you can say, hey, throw some error and have that person handle that. So here's operator not. If we have, so this should return false if we're not good, right? But we already have the ability to figure out if we are good, right? So we want to figure out if we're not good. The easy way to do this is return static cast to a bool ourselves and then return not right this will call this function up here it will return true if we're good false if we're not but we want the opposite of that so we just negate it yes so static is something different than static cast it's two different things. A static variable means that member variable is shared by all instances of that class. A static method means that uh, that method does not operate on any instances of that class. So what do you think it would mean for two um, iterators to be equal to each other? The same position. But like, let's say you have an iterator that's over the range 10 to 20 and you have an iterator that's over the range 0 through 100, and they both just happen to be at 15. Should those iterators be considered the same? No, right? So probably iterators over different ranges should not be considered to be equal to each other ever. So one way we can say that is if the address of range, my range doesn't equal the address of the right-hand side dot range, return false. We will wrap this up on Monday. <laughs>